Good morning. If you would stand, please, in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Reading uh, Psalm 91, here the inspired, inspired writer focuses in on God's protection and deliverance for those who put their faith in Him. The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. For I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High, your dwelling place, no harm will come to you, no plague will come near your tent. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. They will support you with their hands that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And you will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. Now I'm going to personalize the last few verses here. Because she, Erlene, was lovingly devoted to me, I will deliver her. I'll protect her because she knows my name. When, he call, when she calls out to me, I will answer her. I'll be with her in trouble. I'll rescue her, give her honor. I'll satisfy her with a long life and show you 
my great salvation. Pray with me. Dear Father, this is a special time. We have the privilege of honoring one of your choice servants, Erlene O'Toole. God, you blessed our life. Father, through her, Lord, we could see a reflection of your grace and goodness in her character, in her disposition. And we are so very thankful, Father. And we come right now to pay tribute both to her life and the legacy that she's given to all of us here. The example. So bless her family in a special way. Father, during this uh, homegoing celebration, and all the friends that are gathered here, whose lives were touched by her life, for this we pray in the name above every name, the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Again, I want to uh, thank all of you for being here and gathering with this precious family to, to honor this incredible woman. If there is anything in her uh, physical presence that we all remember her, will always remember her by, and that is her incredible, incredible smile. Can I get, a, can I get an amen on that? I mean, no one. In all the 38 years, I passed her 38 years in uh, churches in South Florida and here, and I have never seen anybody with a more beautiful, radiant smile than Erlene. Well, we're going to celebrate, um, and uh, Roy Eamon's going to come. He's going to lead us in some hymns. But may God bless the service, and may God bless each of you. Morning, folks. Hope you join along with some of the favorite hymns. Uh, they're familiar to you. The Word should be up on the grid. You don't have to stand for this. So you just relax down there and we'll get started.
At this time, we have a couple of uh, very close friends of Erlene's that's going to come and share uh, a tribute uh, to her life. Karen Lynn, if you'll come up, and then Anita Wright. If both of you will come up now, and then Karen, you'll begin, and Anita will follow you. Come right up. Yeah, with me. <laughs> I just had a, a couple things I want to read. I mean, I would like to say things on the memories, but it's just, what do you say? Her smile <laughs> and her armor she wore every day with, the, with Jesus. Um, Cindy, uh, had written a little thing when uh, Earlene uh, had her birthday. It's one of her later birthdays, and I'd like to read it. It's a little girl named after her dad, Earl, was born in 31. When she was quite young, it was easy to see the laughter had just begun. Her life was harder than most kids around, but that was no reason to get Earlene down. There was nothing she did that didn't bring joy, like the stick she named Lena and made it her toy. She always has been happy, through thick and through thin. She's a woman of God, it comes from within. The smile that she wears proves this is true. Just being around her will make you smile too. Her honor, her faith, her compassion and love she is truly an angel, God touched from above. <clears throat> With tearful eyes, we watched you suffer and saw you fade away. Although we loved you dearly, we could not make you stay. God saw you getting tired and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around you and whispered, come with me. A golden heart stopped beating, hard working hands at rest. God broke our hearts to prove he only takes the best. It broke our hearts to lose you, Ma, but you didn't go alone for part of us went with you the day God took you home. Arlene Anita Cooper Saboda O'Toole. <laughs> so she was my Aunt Dean. I guess I couldn't say Arlene. And she was my spiritual mom. <laughs> my mother's younger sister. I cannot begin to tell you what you already know, so I won't try. We can talk about her smile, but I can tell you it was the Lord Jesus Christ that was living through her, not just in her. She wasn't a reservoir. She was a channel for the love of God to everyone who met her or knew her. Only God knows how many lives she touched here on this earth. For him, I can think of a lot of things to say, but like John the Baptist said, he wasn't worthy to even buckle the Savior's shoes. I know I'm not worthy, but he is. I know he's the only good in me, and she lived that to all of us. I can think of a couple verses that are very poignant to me. Before I read them, I just want to say, I spent a lot of time 
in her home growing up. I even lived there some. Before school every morning, she prayed with us before she sent us out. That was the most comforting thing as a child. If you have children, before they leave, pray with them. They will be blessed all day and all their life. They will never forget it. I will never forget her sweet prayers. And wisdom. She's a Proverbs 31 woman. I was disappointed once because I wanted my husband to buy some furniture for me. I picked it all out and took and showed it to him and he said no. And she said to me, our disappointments are God's appointments. I never forgot that. Don't ever forget that. Her life was just packed full of wisdom. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have been made new. That was Aunt Dean. That is Aunt Dean. Colossians 3, 1 through 3 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. She lived that. Her mind was set on things above. And Psalm 119.97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day. Her, she was before daylight with her coffee and her Bible in God's word and all through the day and in the evening. Her spirit was so nourished and she shared the bounty of that. One day when we leave this place like she did and join our Lord and are rejoined with our loved ones, we'll have the privilege to see how many people that the Lord brought into his kingdom through her, his servant. The Lord did it. He does the calling, but he uses us if we're willing, if we'll die to ourselves. and she did. She did. And Dean, we know you're there and waiting for when we come. You are missed more than words can say, but the next time we won't ever be separated again for eternity. Our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Thank you, Roy. I love to hear the Lord's Prayer uh, presented in song like that. I had the uh, privilege of going ahead and spending some time with Cindy uh, talking about and listening, listening to her <clears throat> talk about her mom, things that I couldn't have known, but things that confirmed what I believed about Erlene, just knowing her as her pastor. What I observed, she confirmed as she shared with me a lot about her private life, the struggles along the way on that journey like we all have, but how she handled those struggles and those challenges. You know, one of the things, that one of the misconceptions um, of Christianity uh, that some people have is that once you give your heart to him, you turn your life over to, over to him, you're going to be set free from all your troubles. And that's not, uh, that's not quite true. In fact, God never promised, never promised to spare us from problems or, you know, or prevent problems from coming to our life. Not to spare us from, but to see us through problems. And Ar Arlene had the ability uh, and the faith that gave her the victory, even through those tough parts of her own journey. After we talked, Cindy, uh, the Lord led me right to a passage in the Old Testament in Proverbs chapter 31. Uh, some translations uh, call this the praise of a virtuous woman. Some say the praise of a noble woman. In this particular translation I have, it says in praise of the capable woman. Now, it's a long chapter, but I'm not going to read all of it. But I selected a few verses that really ring true. That is the qualities that I saw. And I'm sure all of you did in her lane. Who can find a capable wife, a virtuous woman? For she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he'll lack nothing, anything, not lack anything good. She rewards him with good, not evil, all the days of her life. Her hands stretch out to the poor. She extends her hands to the needy. She's not afraid for her household when it snows, for all in her household are doubly clothed. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she can laugh at a time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and loving instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the acti activities of her household. Her sons rise up and call her blessed, and I would add her daughter. Her husband also praises her. Many women are capable, noble, virtuous, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord will be praised. Give her the reward of her labor, and let her works praise her at the city gates. Now, most of those qualities that are described there certainly relate to the cultural setting of the Old Testament at a far distant time. But let me tell you something. The characteristics that we can gleam out of these verses transcend culture and time. Just to name a few that are very evident here in this chapter. Trustworthy in verse 11. Erlene certainly was trustworthy. Diligent. Several of the verses talk about this great virtuous woman being very diligent. Generous and compassionate, verse 20, how she extends her hands to the poor and the needy. 
self-sufficient, verse 22. A wise woman, which I believe um, one of the tributes had alluded to her wisdom. All these things uh, are embodied in this wonderful lady that we know, Erlene O'Toole. But you know, Erlene right now is not in glory, not in heaven, because of how wonderful she was. Not even because of the way she exemplified all these great traits and characteristics. She's there because she placed her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is something else that I thought about that we can gleam from her life and example. Erlene learned the secret of contentment. Let me say that again. She learned the secret that the Apostle Paul talked about in the New Testament, in the book of Philippians, the secret of contentment. Let me share some verses with you. And I believe, uh, in fact, you uh, alluded to some of those uh, in your tribute. I'll begin in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. If there was ever a woman that I saw that walked in joy, it was always praising God, it was her lane. Let your graciousness be known to everyone, for the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any moral excellence, and if there is any praise, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Then picking up in verse 11, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content. There's that secret of contentment. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. For I know how to have little, I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There are three things to the secret of contentment. And I want to share this with you because if there's anything we can learn from this incredible woman, who we honor and celebrate, whose life we celebrate today. It's the th these three things. Cindy uh, clarified this with me as she shared things I couldn't have known. Some of you have known Earlene, you know, she went through some hard and difficult days and the loss of not only one husband, but two. And of course, there's a great sense of grief when we have to let go of someone this side of heaven. But she was able to go ahead and take all those things that can weight us down. And she did number one, where it says, uh, verse six, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that transcends all human understanding will guard your heart and your mind, your thoughts in Christ Jesus. That's the first thing. You want to learn the secret of contentment, friend. You want to know what it is. What gave Erlene the ability to, to, with that radiant smile, to smile, and certainly undergirded by the joy that was in her heart, was that she learned in the power of prayer by taking the burden off our shoulders and placing it on God's shoulders. She would ease the weight, the weight that can so easily weight us down in this life. The disappointments, the loss, the hurt, the physical suffering, all of that she was able to bring to God. She had a solid prayer life, testified to by her daughter and those who pay tributes here today. She prayed. She met God in the beginning of her day and was able to do that very thing, to take the burdens, give them to God. That's what the scripture tells us to do, you know. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, now when you pray, assuming that every follower of Christ 
is going to pray. And when you pray, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. In other words, placing prayer at the beginning of the day, not listening to news, social media, you know, getting all caught up in all the problems out there, but rather going ahead and saying, Lord, there's a lot of stuff going on right now, me, my family, but I'm giving all these things to you. I'm placing them there at your feet, Lord Jesus. And I love what it says. In return, what does God do for us? He gives, he sets a guard at the doorway of our heart and at the doorway of our mind to protect us and give us that incredible peace that we can't intellectually figure out. We just know when it's there and we have it. Second thing, she was able to make sure her focus was on things above, not things below. That's what you alluded to in your tribute. I was sitting there thinking, amen, because that's exactly what God gave me. In verse 8, look at verse 8. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, what's honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, put your mind on these things, not things that'll bring you down, but things that'll lift you up. That's one of the real secrets of contentment that Paul talked about here, that Arlene learned and knew and practiced. She would always look at the positive side of things. Yeah, there's a lot of bad stuff, you know? Oh, every day you wake up, you're gonna hear bad stuff. But the, the focus of what we choose to put our mind on, what we choose to think of. You know, there's a scripture uh, that Paul wrote in another epistle in 2 Corinthians uh, in chapter 10 verses three through six, and it goes something like this. Talking about our spiritual weapons, they have divine power for the breaking down of strongholds in our mind, destroying silly arguments and foolish arguments, and taking captive, listen to this, Paul said, and taking captive every thought that holds itself up against the word of God. Erlene had the ability to do that. Do what? Capture a thought? Do you realize your body, God created us in such a way with our mind that you can only real, really focus on one thing at a time? I said focus. I know ladies can think of many things at the same time. I'm talking about focus, that we're made in such a way that we can only focus on one thing at a time. Erlene chose to put her thoughts, her focus, in spite of all the bad stuff, okay? To put her thoughts on things above, not things below, things that would build her up, not tear her down. Are you with me? That's the second secret to contentment that that wonderful woman possessed. But there's a third thing, and this is even more supernatural in its complex, where he lays it out very clear. Third but not last, verse 11, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in, for I know both how to live with little how to live with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, living in abundance or need, I am able to do, watch this now, all things. If I may paraphrase that a little bit, I'm able to handle, I'm able to deal with, I'm able to see my way through all things. How? Through Christ, who strengthens me. It's the supernatural power God gives us at the moment when we're facing those trials. If we simply turn to him in childlike faith, she had the ability to do that. Cindy was telling me, she, I, 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 was, she, I think I don't want to misquote you, but I believe you said in summary that I was amazed how my mom was able to keep such a positive disposition, a loving disposition, there was so much stuff going on, it had brought the average person down or become angry or bitter. But no bitterness, no anger. How does a mortal human being do that? Through the supernatural empowerment and strength of the Holy Spirit. If you are a bona fide, born again, born from above child of God sitting here right now, in other words, simply put, if you have placed your faith, your total faith, in the atoning sacrifice 
of Jesus Christ on the cross when he took our sins upon himself, paid the price to bring forgiveness and grace and the hope of heaven to you, then you've got God's Spirit living inside of your body. He's there. And that Holy Spirit has access to our thought life. Our thought life. You heard the expression, so whatever a man thinks, so he is. Or whatever we put our gaze, our focus on, whatever we turn to when times get rough, will determine our response, how we're going to react when tough times come. A few weeks ago, I heard uh, a friend down in West Palm Beach, Florida, tell me, make this statement, and it's so true. And it may sound trite, but it's really not. Here's the statement. Heaven changes everything. I'll say it again. Heaven changes everything. What do we mean by that? It means when we truly believe that we know, that we know, that we know deep down inside of our heart that this is not all there is. This life, this brief, by the way, life that we're living here is not all there is, friend. When we leave this body of ours that gets old <laughs> and, and decays and we get translated into a spiritual body that does not decay, does not get old, where there's no more suffering and no more pain, the reality of that, when you really believe it, I mean really believe it, really, it changes everything. This is how people can face even the reality of death, the finality of it all. And it's 100% true for every person here. We're all going to face it unless Christ comes back before that time. Then we'll get translated without even dying. To be able to know in your heart and have that faith in the reality of heaven. Like the song says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. For I know who holds my future. And as a result, life is worth the living just because he lives. You know, or that him, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me. It sounds probably maybe to someone here. Oh, come on now, man. Walks with me, talks with me. Yeah. Erlene believed it. And <laughs> she would walk around with a bounce in her step, maybe humming a hymn or a tune. Why? I'll say it again. Because heaven changes everything. Let me give you a glimpse right here in closing, okay? In the very last book of the Bible, in the second to last chapter, there is a beautiful description that John the Apostle, while banished from his family and friends on an island of Patmos as a punishment by Rome for his uh, belief in Jesus Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote this last book of the Bible and got a vision uh, incredible vision of things to come. But in the second to last chapter, listen to the description that he gives us of heaven. This is beautiful. Again, and keep in mind what I said, heaven changes everything. Here's John describing the beauty of what he's seen in the permanent home that will one day be yet to come. She's in glory now in his presence, but there's going to be this beautiful thing that's going to happen uh, down the road at some point in God's timing. Listen to this. John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. I also saw the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Picture that. This was um, John's way uh, in the language of appearance to basically, inspired by the Spirit, describe what he saw. And when he thought of how beautiful it was, what came to his mind? A bride on her wedding day, walking down the aisle. Well, I had two experiences like that that were beautiful sights. One was my wife 
walking down the aisle to meet me at the, the front to share our vows and commitment to each other. 46 years ago, 46 years this year with mine, Marilyn's here. And then the other one was my daughter, the privilege of walking my daughter down the aisle right here in this church and then coming up to lead in the ceremony. Oh, beautiful. John said, it's like a bride adorned on a wedding day. Then he goes on. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now watch this. Listen. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. No more crying, friend. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will no longer be no longer because the previous things, the old order of things have passed away and behold, everything, one day, friend, will be made new. Wow. Did you get that? <laughs> and our dear friend, your dear friend, your wonderful mother and family and grandma, he's already there experiencing the very presence of God that defies our, our finite mind. We can't comprehend what that looks like. All I can say is this. Think of the most beautiful sight you've ever seen right here in this world, in this fallen, broken world. What a sunset over the bay, over here at Perdido Beach, or the beautiful mountains in North Carolina, or some other spectacular view that you've seen. Friend, anything that we've seen that we call beautiful down here will be dwarfed by the glory of God when heaven is revealed to us. Heaven is for real, not make-believe. And why we call this a celebration, a home-going celebration and not a funeral, is because that describes what it really, really is for us. It's not a finality. Like, oh, that's it. Well, you know, nice knowing you. Goodbye. Do you realize for the Christian there really is no goodbye? Think about that now, okay? If you're a born-again child of God, friend, we're, gonna, we're all going to see her lean again. So you don't, you don't say goodbye. What's the more appropriate phrase? Earlene? She's not there, by the way. <laughs> so I look up here. Earlene, we're going to see you later. That's a more appropriate biblical response. We're going to see her later. For her grandchildren, you're, you're going to see her later if you put your faith in Christ. That's the key. And I would be remiss, and I know she would be angry with me, if I didn't say to everyone here, if you have never placed your faith, now listen to me, hear my heart, okay? I'm a Vietnam veteran here, okay? God spared me in Vietnam, took me home. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, don't you wait. I beg you, dear friend, I beg you, reconsider Jesus. Reconsider faith in him. And it will make a profound difference in the life that you are living right now, here and now. Because heaven changes everything. Would you stand, please? Or I'll come and sing.
Father in heaven, we are so glad that we could assemble here and have this celebration today. Lord, help us to take away from our time here the example, the incredible example of a life well lived in early in O'Toole. And Lord, seek to apply some of those very traits through the power of your Holy Spirit that we too can live a life worthy of the calling and a legacy that the ones coming after us can follow in. For this we ask and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. God bless you all. God bless you. And greet the family here if you like.